Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador reaffirmed on Thursday his position that the next summit of the Americas shall be held without exclusions. The Peruvian Congress will decide Thursday whether to admit a motion to question Prime Minister Aníbal Torres for the extension of the state of emergency due to COVID-19 and for announcing a bill to bring the elections forward. In Sweden, the United Nations Secretary General called for action to tackle climate change on the first day of the Stockholm Plus 50 summit. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, Dio Martin. From the Telstar Studios in Havana, we begin with the news. The president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, insisted that for the next summit of the Americas, no country in the region should be excluded. The head of state indicated that he is still waiting for his U.S. counterpart, Joe Biden, to agree to invite all the countries to the ninth summit of the Americas. The head of state stressed that he has a very good relationship with the government of Joe Biden and with his collaborators, the head of state of Department Anthony Blinken, and with his advisor in security matters, Jake Sullivan. In this context, López Obrador indicated that he is still waiting for the response from the United States regarding the proposals for the summit. The government of Argentina declared that it will attend the Summit of the Americas on behalf of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states SELAC. During a press conference, Gabriela Cerruti, spokeswoman for the Argentinian government, said that the decision of President Alberto Fernandez to attend the meeting in Los Angeles, United States, is the result of a dialogue with the representatives of the regional bloc, especially with the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador. Cerruti indicated that the Argentinian president will present the concerns of Latin America on the current context and will advocate for unity in the region. Finally, the official ruled out the celebration of a parallel summit of the Latin American alliance since not all members of this entity will be present. The Peruvian Congress will define Thursday the petition to question the Prime Minister Aníbal Torres for the extension of the state of emergency in the framework of the COVID-19 pandemic. As an excuse for the request against Torres, it is stated that the presidency of the Council of Ministers did not carry out an analysis of the temporality, reasonability and necessity of the measures applied for the containment of the pandemic. In the same way, Torres will be questioned to explain his allusions to the early general elections. In this context, analysts assure that this motion is another attempt of the Peruvian right wing in the parliament to sabotage the mandate of President Pedro Castillo. In Costa Rica, political and labor organizations rejected the initiative to eliminate the eight-hour workday while assuring that it constitutes a step backward in human rights. Last Tuesday, the Legislative Assembly summoned various political, union and social actors to discuss a project that seeks to restructure the working day to 12 hours of work during four consecutive days and three days off. However, the Broad Front Party rejected the proposal and requested that it be discussed based on studies on the damages of this measure on the mental and physical health of workers. For its part, the Costa Rican Union and Social Unitary Bloc pointed out that the new proposal suppresses, among other aspects, the payment of overtime while they denounced that it is an imposition of slave conditions. Puerto Rico's Governor Pedro Pierluisi requested assistance from the U.S. federal government to fight crime. Pierluisi made the request to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to revive the Operation Caribbean Resistance Program due to the more than 20 murders that have occurred on the island in the last week. The measure was applied in 2012 and increased for four months the number of agents from Homeland Security-related offices to deal with violent crimes and criminal organizations. The Puerto Rican governor made the request during a meeting with the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, as part of several meetings that Pierluisi had between May 30th and the 31st with members of President Joe Biden's cabinet. A year after the conflict broke between armed groups in the south of Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, various political, social, economic and cultural groups are denouncing the government's neglect in curbing a crime surge which affects the entire country, but more severely the capital. On June 1, 2021, gang clashes began for the control of Martissant, the area that links Port-au-Prince with the four southern departments. 
The situation has forced more than 20,000 people to flee their homes. Many of them are sleeping in the streets. Children and young people are out of schools since schools had to close. Haiti's Transport Workers Union has joined other organizations in questioning the government of Ariel Henry, and they are calling on making the situation visible on all platforms. More than 300 public transport vehicles have been attacked, hijacked, or burnt. The ongoing armed conflict in Haiti has claimed the lives of more than 180 people so far in 2022. The emergence of monkeypox continues to cause concern and fears of a new pandemic, but the World Health Organization rules this out as a possibility as it is a known virus. For the past month, the United Nations Agency has recorded more than 550 cases in 30 countries where the disease is not endemic and appears only exceptionally. The arrival of monkeypox in Europe, the Americas and the Middle East has set off alarm bells in recent weeks. For this reason, the WHO called on nations to step up vigilance to prevent further infections. The agency explains that the monkeypox has similarities to the human smallpox virus that was eradicated in the 1980s. Investigations are ongoing, but the sudden appearance of monkeypox in many countries at the same time suggests there may have been undetected transmission for some time. Telesur will expand its signal with new satellite parameters since more than ever the world connects to us and our stories are being heard in other further away nations. These parameters will be in place on June the 1st in Latin America and the Caribbean, both in English and in Spanish, and quite soon further changes will be implemented for the signals in Europe and Middle East and Africa. This new multi-platform will continue providing truthful content to oppose the hegemonic media's narrative and our faithfulness to our audience remains the same. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hello and welcome back to From the South. In Sweden, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for action to tackle climate change on the first day of the Stockholm Plus 50 Summit. The event, which commemorates the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment and celebrates 50 years of global environmental action, had during the address of Guterres the calling for action to tackle climate change, biodiversity, loss, pollution and waste. Guterres said all nations must do more to protect the basic human right to a clean environment asserting that the current rate of global consumption exceeds planetary capabilities by far. Venezuela assured Thursday at the international meeting of Stockholm Plus 50 that the main cause of the environmental crisis the planet experiences is the capitalist model of production. During her online speech, Vice President Delcy Rodriguez said that this is the worst crisis of humanity and that she held responsible the capitalist model that has attempted against the rights of Mother Earth. Rodriguez called on the peoples of the world to raise their awareness in view of the increase in temperatures, rising sea levels and drought, and highlighted her country's efforts to plant 33 million trees and to guarantee that 43 percent of the territory is protected. The Stockholm Plus 50 International Meeting brings together world leaders to celebrate 50 years since the United Nations launched its first conference on the environment. The terrible environmental crisis that threatens the very existence of the human species. The main cause of this crisis, the intervention of men. The predatory production model of an exacerbated capitalism that has attacked the rise of Mother Earth. In Brazil, the death toll rose to 122 after heavy rains caused landslides and floods in the state of Pernambuco. According to local authorities, the bodies of five people, among them a child, were recovered in the localities of Recife and Limoeiro. 
In the midst of the climatic situation, 24 municipalities were declared in a state of emergency and the number of fatalities is expected to increase. It was also reported that over 7,000 people are homeless due to the damage caused by the rains. In this context, the citizens expressed that they have been abandoned by their government due to the lack of support to the communities during the catastrophe. Meanwhile, local authorities reported that rescue teams continue with search and rescue operations for possible survivors. The Forecast Center of Cuba's Meteorological Institute issued an early warning on Wednesday due to expected heavy rains over the next few days in the west and center of the country. According to a communique from the Meteorological Institute, the rains could turn into a tropical depression in the next few hours. According to the weather forecast, the low pressures to the northeast of the Caribbean Sea and the Yucatan Peninsula could cause showers and thunderstorms. Therefore, an alert has been issued because rainfall could intensify and exceed 200 millimeters in some areas. In the Isle of Youth, one of the areas at risk of flooding, several provisions are being made. We are perfectly able to assimilate, and we are in a position to assimilate, a large-scale phenomenon, a high incidence of rainfall, because we have the technical and operational conditions to do so. Peru's government extended for 90 days more on Thursday the environmental emergency in the central coast affected by the spillage of 12,000 barrels of oil by the Repsol Energy Corporation. The decision seeks to guarantee the coastal area's cleanup plan, which had been hindered by the region's fishing and tourist activities. The spill on January 15th occurred when the Italian flagged vessel Maradoricum was unloading crude oil at the Pampilla refinery in Ventanilla, 30 kilometers north of Lima. Repsol initially blamed the incident to the waves generated by a volcanic eruption in Tonga on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome back. The Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peshkov accused Ukraine of blocking negotiations to solve the conflict as it reached a hundred days on Thursday. The senior official assured that Kyiv was quite aware of Moscow's demands. However, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said otherwise. Peshkov assured that Western allies continue to pressure Kyiv and after reaching some basic agreements, it has shown a preference for another option that is not on the negotiations table. The military operation launched by Russia on February 24th had as general objectives the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, according to the Russian government. In the negotiations initiated on March 29th between Kiev and Moscow, Russia established its demands, which after a hundred days and after being initially accepted, Ukraine does not recognize. Now, the Russian ruble emerged as the best performing currency in 2022 despite wide ranging sanctions imposed for its special military operation in Ukraine. As of May, it was nearly 30 percent higher against the United States dollar. According to two months after the ruble's value fell to less than a U.S. penny amid the SWIFT test, toughest economic sanctions in modern history, Russia's currency has mounted a stunning turnaround. The ruble has jumped 40 percent against the dollar since January. Normally, a country facing international sanctions and a major military conflict would see a steady outflow of capital, causing its currency to drop. But Russia's measures to keep money from leaving the country, in combination with the force for analysis of Western sanctions, are working to create demand for rubles and pushing up its value. U.S. President Joe Biden said his administration has no immediate way to bring down the cost of gasoline and is considering to set a lower price for sale of Russian oil. High prices for gas and food have emerged as an explosive political problem for the U.S. head of state whose party faces the loss of one or both chambers of Congress in November's midterm elections. Gas prices in the North American nation now average of nearly $5 a gallon, a record according to the American Automobile Association. The U.S. has used strategic reserves to try and limit the pain, and President Biden asserted that his administration's efforts helped keep prices at the pump from going even higher. 
With Europe moving towards spending its purchases of Russian oil, Biden has signaled that the U.S. could allow certain Russian oil sales to be subject to a price cap. The United Nations issued a report on the increased incidence of civilian deaths and human rights violations in Mali over the past few months. According to a UN report, 248 civilians have died by the hands of security forces in Mali in over the first three months of this year. Moreover, there's been a tenfold increase in human rights violations committed by the state, but with the added element of having been backed by foreign military. In Yemen, the parties to an armed conflict that has lasted for the past seven years agreed to extend for two more months of the temporary ceasefire enforced last April. According to United Nations Special Envoy to Yemen, Hans Grundberg, the idea of extending the ceasefire was a UN initiative and it will be implemented under the same terms as the original agreement between the government and the rebels. The ceasefire has significantly helped reduce civilian deaths and in reactivating some commercial flights. However, no progress has been made in the agreed upon handover of the province of Taiz and other regions still under Houthi control. In Syria, a terrorist attack on a bus in the Deir Ezzel province left three civilians dead and 21 injured. Witnesses confirmed the civilian status of the vehicle and its crew, while the insurance authorities reported that immediate assistance was provided to the victims, several of whom remain in serious condition at al-Assad hospital. The conflict between the Syrian government and terrorist groups sponsored by foreign powers continues on the way to a solution that will allow the establishment of peace throughout the territory and the return of refugees. Relations between Washington and Ankara may be strained again after the State Department and the Turkish presidency exchanged warnings over the incident where Turkey's forces attacked U.S. coalition's positions in Syria. Turkish forces on Wednesday attacked several positions in the northwestern Syrian province of Idlib, including locations of the so-called international coalition led by the United States and the Kurdish-majority Kobani countryside in northern Syria. Damascus also confirmed the attack, which came hours after the Turkish president announced the beginning of a new military offensive in northern Syria, claiming to be fighting Kurdish militias, considered by his government to be terrorist organizations. And Japan's Coast Guard accused China of trespassing its territory off the coast of the Senkaku Islands at the Okinawa Prefecture Thursday. China, however, confirms they were patrolling in their territorial waters. The Japanese Coast Guard reported states that four Chinese patrol boats invaded Japan's waters between 25 and 29 kilometers southwest of Wotsuri Island, which is part of the archipelago disputed by both countries. Beijing contradicts the Japanese version and ratifies that on June 2nd, the 23st Coast Guard fleet patrolled the Chinese territorial waters. The tension between China and Japan over this territory escalated after 2012 when the Japanese government bought three of the five Diayu Islands from a private holder. Tokyo accused Beijing of at least nine invasions since May 14th. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telesur English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.